I want to welcome those that are joining us online. How you doing in the house? Okay, okay. Part five, the king and his kingdom coming your way. Matthew chapter four. I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter four. That's where we're going to be today. Matthew chapter four. Part five, as we continue this teaching series, the king and his kingdom. The main idea today is repentance requires humility. We're talking about two big words that we don't really want to talk about, but are absolutely needed for all of us, for our lives, for the growth, to live like Jesus, for his glory, for his name, for his fame. Amen? Repentance requires humility. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. He was hungry. Then the tempter approached him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. He answered, it is written, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, Throw yourself down, for it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you, and they will support you with their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Verse 7, Jesus told him, it is also written, do not test the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, I will give you all these things if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus told him, go away, Satan, get behind me, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and angels came and began to serve him. Look back to verse one, Jesus led into the wilderness by the spirit of God to be tempted I want to draw a strong distinction between test and temptations. There's this misconception that God tempts us. That is false. You don't find that in the word of God. There's only one tempter. We see it in the text before us. His name is the devil, the enemy. Now, there are tests that we walk through. And after the fact, we can praise God. During the test, it's quite often we're praying, asking God why. Why the test? Why one one more? What are you doing here? We ask the questions as we walk through the test of life. The Lord tests us. The devil tempts us. Don't be confused and don't get it wrong and don't switch it up. The Lord tests us. The devil tempts us. James is writing to the church of Jewish believers that have been scattered abroad. They are facing, they have faced, and they are facing persecution. And he writes this in James chapter one, verse two. I would encourage you to write this down. James chapter one, verse two. Consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. He's writing this message of encouragement, this letter of encouragement to a people that are facing persecution. Many have died because of the persecution because of the for the sake of the gospel and he says this interesting interesting words to note consider it great joy whenever you experience various trials why why should we consider the trials that we are walking through the tests that we are involved with how are we to be joyful about it i mean that's so counterculture right the world would say fall apart, run, run, run away. And, and we're the, the message of the, the gospel is to run to Jesus, toward Jesus, not away from him. There can be joy in the midst of trials. And verse three is crucial because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. The testing of your faith, the tests that we go through, they will produce an endurance within us to keep on so that when the next test comes, not that it's any easier, but we see it for what it really is. One, that the Lord our God is with us, 
There's never a moment that he will forsake us. He hasn't turned his back uh, on us. He's in all the details of life. And so will we trust him? What is he trying to reveal to you and I in the midst of the, the test? There's always something. There's always something. It's for our good. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says, all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. There's a purpose for the pain that we endure. The Lord tests to build up our faith. I've always admired those that have been walking with Jesus for some time. I've always admired sitting down and hearing their stories of faith. Oftentimes we look at some people, if we're honest, we look at some people and we think, man, they got it all together. They have never gone wrong. <laughs> yeah, we just haven't been uh, the other side of the front door. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, and so oftentimes we're running, we, you know, why can't I have that? Why can't I have this life? Why can't I have that home or this, you know, this thing, whatever it is? And why can't I have that marriage? And it's like, we think it's like picture perfect. Oh, it's Instagram ready. No, no, no. No, 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 no. Every person this side of heaven has experienced some significant kind of pain. Why? Because we live in a sinful, broken world in need of Jesus desperately. And so the Lord tests. The devil tempts. Charles Spurgeon said our, our Lord was led into the wilderness. The place was one of great solitude where he would be alone in the conflict. I believe there's a solitude is a good spiritual discipline. It's a good practice to, to take time of, to be alone, to be silent before God. But I will encourage you, uh, you can't live there. In fact, uh, there are many that would love to live there because of how God has created you. Maybe your personality. You're like, you're, you're, you're the person like in the corner or trying to get out of the party as fast as possible. You know what I'm talking about? And, uh, and so because you want to run home and, and to the place of solitude. It's good practice to be silent uh, and alone before the Lord, but you can't live there. We were created for community. We need each other. Look around just for a moment. If you're online, I don't know how you're going to do that, but uh, perhaps in your home, you, you, we need community. We need brothers and sisters that are going to speak into our life. We need people that are going to encourage us. We need to be encouragers to them. It works all kinds of ways. God designed it. We need community. A couple weeks, we're going to be launching discovery groups, and it's a great opportunity to find a group that meets apart from Sunday morning, where you can gather in a home for an hour, two, three hours, depending on how the group runs, but where you can be reminded that you're not alone. The enemy would love to get you alone, to take you out. We see Jesus is alone, and we see that after he fasted 40 days, do you see that in the text? After he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was, he was hungry. Now, what is fasting? What is fasting? Uh, I don't know if, you've ex if you have experienced the spiritual discipline of fasting. It is a spiritual discipline. We find it all through scriptures. It's a wonderful spiritual discipline. Uh, the, the world has branded it as science. You know, science, if you, if you fast, it can kill some different things and and although there's some truth to that, it's how God designed our bodies, really. But that's another message. But fasting is giving up something physical to replace it with something spiritual. Oftentimes, throughout Scripture, we see it's food. We give up what we, what we uh, want the most. Uh, Jesus fasts for 40 days. I, I Legit, uh, four hours would probably be my cap, man, you know? But um, in fact, all night long, my wife was making this chili for this chili cook-off, and uh, and it was brewing. It was brewing. I smelt it all night long. And, uh, and then you, you, you smelt it coming in. Now, now you're all hungry, right? You're hungry. And uh, that's, it, it's, it's amazing, the brain. That's all we can think about right now. But let's think of the word. And, and so uh, Jesus, he just comes off of this 40-day fast. I mean, if you've experienced a fast with Jesus, giving up something physical for something spiritual, you know what's happening here. One of the greatest of highs in your life. The greatest of highs, spending time with the Lord, him revealing what needs to change in your life, him revealing how good he is, how faithful he is. Uh, and so I would encourage you, if you've never fasted, to, to fast. Take time. Start with one day. One day. Remove it all. Each time that you would go to eat, go into that prayer closet and get before the Lord. Cry out to him. Dig into his word. Spend more time with, with him. Jesus is just coming off of this, this, this fast. So he's hungry. He's hungry. 
Uh, he's alone. And what does the devil do? He sees the moment of opportunity. Oh, you think the devil doesn't know? You think you're smarter than him? No, no. Now, we know that we serve the one who is smarter. He's above all things. That's the Lord Jesus, amen? But there's one that he knows. He knows your most vulnerable uh, moments of life. He, he knows what, what's gonna get you. And, and so he sees Jesus in this wilderness. Jesus coming off of this fast. He's hungry. He's alone. Three temptations. We see three temptations. And Jesus responds to each of the three temptations with the word of God. Don't miss that. The temptation in uh, verse 4, verse 7, verse 10. Do you see that? Verse 4, verse 7, verse 10. Three times the devil comes to tempt Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He responds with the word of God. He responds with the word of God. Verse 4, he responds with Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Verse 7, he responds with Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. Verse 10, he responds with Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. Each temptation, he responds with the word of God. Look at the first temptation. The tempter, that's the devil, approached him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Interesting that Jesus is just coming off this fast. And what's the first thing that he tempts him with? Ooh, you want some of that fresh, that fresh homemade bread. You know what I'm saying? Like, not the store kind. I'm talking the legit stuff, okay? The clay oven stuff, you know? I've always loved that about Israel when I travel. Um, supposed to be there last week, actually. It's postponed to next year. But I've always loved that, dining with the, with the fresh bread. Oh, man, so good. And so the enemy tempts him. Jesus is just coming off this fast. He's hungry. Oh, here's some bread. And what does Jesus say? No, sir. Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then, then, then note the second temptation. The second temptation, the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Notice this. Jesus responds to the first temptation with scripture. Uh, and, and, then, and then the second temptation, the second temptation as clever as the enemy might be, tries to respond uh, or add to this temptation with Scripture. What does Jesus do? Of course, he responds with Scripture. Do not test the Lord your God. He responds right back. Notice that in these three temptations, in these three responses, Jesus doesn't even give any commentary. I mean, he doesn't preach a sermon to him. No, he responds with Scripture. When the temptations come your way, your only response, my only response, is the word of God. It needs to be the word of God. Do not test the Lord, your God. Third temptation, took him to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms, all the kingdoms, all the splendor, all the majesty that goes along with the kingdoms. But he failed to forget that there's only one kingdom that lasts above it all. And there's only one king seated on his throne and it's the Lord Jesus. He tries to tempt him with it all. And then Jesus says, get behind me. Go away, Satan. Worship the Lord your God and serve him. Uh, serve only him. This word worship is a beautiful word. It literally means to bow down before him. It's a sign of humility. It's a posture of humility. When they would worship God, they would bow down. And why? Because they would get as low as they could. As low as they could. Humility is so important for the Christian walk especially in the world that we're living in when it's all about pride, it's all about, it's all about ego. We, we need humility. We need to be a humble people. We need to practice humility. So Jesus responds to all three situations with the word of God. The devil keeps on coming after him. And after the third time, the devil leaves him. Angels came and began to serve him. How do we stand against the temptations of the devil? I want to encourage you with a, a few thoughts. The first is I must be prepared. We must be prepared. To think that the temptations aren't going to come would be absolutely foolish. Just ask the person next to you, have you been tempted this week? <laughs> They're coming. The, the enemy doesn't want you living for the Lord. 
The enemy doesn't want you experiencing life. We, we need to know this about the enemy. He, he's, a, he's a thief coming to steal, kill, and destroy. That's who the enemy is. He's coming after you. He wants to tear you apart. Death and destruction. He doesn't want you experiencing life and life more abundantly. John 10, 10. And so how do we stand against the temptations of the enemy? We must be prepared. Make it personal today. I must be prepared. We see Jesus was prepared. Again, he had just fasted 40 days and 40 nights. That's what the passage tells us. He was prayed up. He had removed anything uh, to, to just to be alone with the Father. We need to be ready for the temptations and attacks that are coming our way. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Would you write that reference down? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 says this. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. How do we stand against them? By putting on the full armor of God. We need to be ready every day. If you're trying just to be ready on Sundays, that ain't going to cut it. No, each day that you wake up, you need to ask the Lord, Lord, help me to put on the full armor of God. Full armor of God. Why? So we can stand against the evil schemes, the attacks that are coming after us. Uh, listen, you don't prepare uh, for battle during the battle. You prepare for the battle before the battle. There should be a plan before you go into battle. Part of this plan is putting on you and I each day the full armor of God so we're able to withstand the attacks of the evil one. Secondly, would you write this down? We must pray constantly. Pray constantly. I must pray constantly. Make it personal again. I don't know what your life looks like. I don't know what your day-to-day -day looks like. I don't know what your prayer life looks like, but I would just encourage you today. I would encourage you. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, two words, pray constantly. <laughs> two words, pray constantly. Take, take some evaluation of your life. You know, when things come up, what's the first response? Is it prayer? Oftentimes, it's, it's some aggravation, frustration, maybe some other words. But would you shift that? Would you shift that to prayer? Would you surrender it over to the Lord Jesus? Would you trust him rather than being filled with the anxiety? And you know what I'm talking about. Filled to overflow with, with the feelings of everything's falling apart. No, surrender it over to him through prayer. Take time throughout the day to just thank God for his many blessings in your life. I, I was walking the dog the other night uh, outside and I looked up and the stars, I mean, it was one of those nights. It's one of those nights that the stars were just popping out, man. They were just, they were just so clear. It was, it was beautiful. And I was quickly reminded that, um, man, I'm not, I don't take enough time to pause, look up and admire God's beautiful creation and thank him and praise him. For how good he is. Pray, pray constantly. Pray, pray constantly. Third, would you write this down? We must walk with Lord daily. It's important if we're going to stand against the temptations and attacks of the enemy that we walk with him daily. There's too many part-time, so-called part-time Christians, too many Sunday goers. No, no, no. It was never about the Sunday going. Uh, it was about the how we're living uh, each day of our lives. We're called to uh, uh, worship as an offering, worship as a sacrifice. And so it's not just about the Sunday gathering. It's not just about this one hour that takes place, although I love this one hour. I love this one hour. I, I pray hard for this one hour throughout the week. I plan hard for this one hour and the staff as well. We love the engagement as we are able to look people in their eyes and give hugs and Ask how you are doing and genuinely mean it <laughs> and, and pray for people. And I love this one hour gathering, but it cannot be a, only about this one hour gathering as believers in Christ Jesus. Amen. There's no part-time Christians. And so walk with the Lord daily. Would you take time today? In a moment, we're going to have a response time. Would you take time just to self-examination of what does my walk look like daily? Am I, am I holding on, just holding out for Sunday? The next, would you write this down? We must remove anything or anyone that is hindering our walk with the Lord. Make it personal again. I must remove anything or anyone that is hindering my walk with the Lord. Are the people that you're surrounding yourself with, are they pushing you closer to Christ? Are they pulling you away from Christ? Now, we never stop being a witness 
We never stop being a missionary uh, for Christ. We never uh, stop li- being lived sent out into the world. However, the people that have the most influence and impact in our lives, we need to consider, are they pushing us to Christ? Are they pulling us away from him? Are they helping us become fully devoted followers of Jesus? Or are they hindering us from becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus? How do we stand against the attacks, uh, the temptations of the enemy? Next, we, we must know the word. We must, we must know the word. Again, it, it, it can, Sunday morning cannot be the only time that you and I open up this word, this living, breathing word that's before us. More accessibility than ever before, ever before in the history of the world. This word is accessible. It's here. It's present. It's waiting to be opened. We must know the word. Jesus says this in John 8. Would you write that reference down? John chapter 8, verse 31. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word. Do you hear that? If you continue in my word, you are really my disciples. Verse 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's what Jesus says. Do you know the word? Do we know the word? In those moments of conflict, in those moments of discouragement, what is our response? What promises are we holding on to, standing firm on? We need to know the word, church. Maybe in all the goals of a new year, Perhaps knowing the word should be at the top priority for all of us. How do we, how do we know the word? Uh, there's, there's lots of ways and lots of practices. I won't go into all those, but I, I will share three, uh, three steps. The first is to read the word. Uh, if you want to know the word, read the word. In fact, we're so committed to helping our church read the word that every month we produce a reading plan. The last Sunday of each month, they're in the back in our next steps, and they stay there all month long. We're encouraging the church to read through Corinthians this month. And so I would encourage you, the last Sunday of each month, take one of those. They're also, there's a digital form online. You can add it to your phone, screenshot it, so it's always with you. And, uh, and read the word. Jump in the word. Dig into the word. Read it. How do we, how do we know the word? First, read it. Second, Memorize, memorize the word. Now, I'm not talking like, hey, go after entire chapters here. <laughs> start with one verse. I mean, start, start with one verse. This, this is a, a marathon. This isn't a sprint. And if you want to learn the word, know the word, hold on to the word, and memorize it one verse at a time. Write it down somewhere where you can read through it. Memorize, memorize it. Read it, then memorize it. And then third, I just encourage you, if you want to know the word, learn the word, tell someone. Tell someone what you're memorizing. Tell someone what you're reading. Tell someone what you're learning. Uh, That helps me so much in memorization. People ask me, how how can you memorize so many people's names? Well, it's because after I meet them, and I try my best, uh, I'm not perfect. (laughs) But, But one thing that's been helpful is after I meet someone, I will tell myself the name. I will recite the name over and over and over again. And then I will go up to some of our staff or some of our pastors, some of our elders, some of our team leaders. And I would say, hey, have you met this person, their name, mentioning their their name? And so tell somebody, hey, what what you're reading, you don't know what that person is going through. And the, the, the text that you're reading could just be the answer that they need to hear. Tell someone. Hey, let's be bold. To tell someone the word of God. How do we stand against the temptations of the enemy? Lastly, would you write this down? We, we must be humble. I, I must be humble. And again, we, we live in a proud world. It, it, it is shocking to me how everyone wants a trophy and recognition. Hey, in just a moment, we're going to have Discovery 500 here. And I guarantee you, there's only going to be one winner, Okay. If you got an issue with that, well, you, I, I don't know what to tell you, but we, we, I mean, we want to encourage it. We want to encourage children to, to do well, but listen, we, there's, there's such a, it's me centric 
And I wonder, what if the real answer, what if the real answer to the problems of this world, the real answer to the conflict in your home, the conflict at work, what if the real answer is humility? What if the real answer is humility? St. Moses, the black Ethiopian, he said this, you fast, but, but Satan does not eat. You labor fervently, but Satan never sleeps. The only dimension with which you can outperform Satan is by acquiring humility. For Satan has no humility. Satan has no humility. How do we stand against the temptations of the devil, the attacks of the devil? Through humility. Humility. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Would you write that reference down? 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. So whoever thinks he stands must be careful not to fall. All right? You've ever had those proud moments? And look what I did. And then the thing came crashing down. So whoever thinks he stands must be careful not to fall. Verse 13, no temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful. Do you hear that? God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to bear it. God offers the way out. Whatever the temptation is, God is faithful. He is present. He's a God of provision. Would you trust him to provide us as he does? As we look at a verse like that, I can't help but think within the context of, it, of, of its writing is it's possible that without humility, we don't see the way out. So all we see is the temptation before us. Without humility, all we see are the attacks, the attacks, and they just feel like they're so overwhelming at times, right? But through humility, as we bow before God, as we worship him and him alone, as he is the number one priority for your life and my life, as he is the number one satisfaction that a lot of things are going to try and take his place and try and satisfy you, but really, they're not going to last. He's the only one that lasts. And as he's the number one affection in a world full of, I mean, we, we say, I, I, I love everything. Chocolate, you know, ice cream, like cookies. I love, you know, it's like, no, no, no. There's only one who should hold my affection, and it's the Lord, Lord my God, because he has an unconditional love for me and for humanity. And so humility. Repentance requires humility. I would challenge us to take time today to consider our lives. To consider our lives. And respond in humility. Look to, back to the text, Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. When he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew from, into Galilee. He left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum by the sea. In the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Verse 15, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali along the road of the sea. Beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who live in darkness have seen a great light. And for those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. We see the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy right here before us as Jesus begins his earthly ministry. It's coming alive. The, the word is coming alive. It's being fulfilled. Verse 17, from then on, Jesus began to preach, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. From then on, this was Jesus' message. Repent. Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. A few years back, we were in Israel, Audra and I, and, and, and a few people in our church, and, and we went to Capernaum. There, there's a few pics. We went to Capernaum, and Capernaum uh, was the town where Jesus did a lot of ministry, 
and uh, that's the Sea of Galilee that's on uh, Capernaum, is to the north of the Sea of Galilee, Audrini, uh, fl floating by boat, not, not walking on the water. And then, um, and this is Capernaum, one of the temples. It's, it's an incredible archaeological site, Capernaum. It's, a, it's a smaller than I thought, but wonderfully excavated. Uh, there's, there should be one more, uh, perhaps, and uh, or, or that's the view from Capernaum, the Sea of Galilee, and, and then there's one more um, that you can just kind of see the, the, the remains, the ruins, right, as Jesus is ministering to the people. And this is the message at that time as, as they're, they're, they're worshiping whoever they want, whatever deities, and Jesus is saying, no, no, repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Listen, uh, the king demands repentance. The king demands turning from, from sin. How can we serve sin and the Savior at the same time? It, ca it cannot happen. And so I wonder, what, what does your life look like today? Are you still trying to build your own kingdom or, or his kingdom? And I, I hope and I would encourage you, push you forward just a bit to, to build his kingdom. If you're living and trying to rule and reign over your own kingdom, would you today, would you surrender over to him? Would you surrender over the, whatever it is, the pride, the, whatever it is, the accolades, the desire, the, the notice, and say, here I am, God. I want to live for your king. I want to build your kingdom. I believe that you are the king. There's only one king that sits on the throne over his kingdom, and it's the Lord Jesus. And so the kingdom man's turning from sin. This is the message. Repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. And this has been the message throughout the scriptures ever since the fall in Genesis chapter 3. Repent. Come back to God. Surrender everything over. Trust him that he and he alone is able to forgive of all our sins. And fill us up with a hope. Repentance requires humility. I'm going to close with this scripture. 1 Peter chapter 5. Verse 5 says, in the same way, you who are younger be subject to the elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility. Do you see that? Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. What a wonderful prayer it would begin. It would be to pray daily. Join me praying this prayer. God, would you clothe me in humility? Would you clothe me in humility? If there's any pride within me, would you strip it away? Remove it? Replace it with humility. I wonder today where you find yourself. I wonder today what life beyond this Sunday gathering looks like. Would you be honest before the Lord? Perhaps there's some sin that you're presently involved with that you need to repent of. You need to turn from. Surrender it over to the Lord Jesus and return to him. Perhaps there's some temptation before you. You need to acknowledge the temptation today. And you need to stand firm and resist. Say, God, give me the power upon the authority of your word, the truth of your word. I'm going to turn. I'm going to turn and flee the things of the world and pursue the things of the word. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place? Let's align with this for a moment. Would you just get along with, with the Lord? Just get along with him just for a moment. The quietness of this room. I wonder what your decision is today. I wonder where you find yourself. your life look like today? Would you just ask God, God, what is my response from this? Just ask him, would you examine my heart, examine my life? Is there any, any way, any wicked way within me? Any pride? Would you remove it today? It's so all across this place, those online, so you're getting along with the Lord and just asking him, Can you honestly answer today in a humility 
is winning. <laughs> Perhaps it's pride that's alive. And you would just ask the Lord to remove it, place it with humility today. As people are praying all across this place and online, I wonder if there's someone here that's never surrendered over to the Lord Jesus. Today would be the day. Today would be the day of salvation for you. Today would be the day that changes your life, changes everything. So if that's you, as people are praying, perhaps you've never received the gift of salvation, I want you to know it's available today because of Christ Jesus. And so wherever you're at, in the house, online, perhaps it's your prayer. Dear Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. I am a sinner and you are the Savior. I trust you completely. I believe in you. You walked this earth died on a cross, placed in a grave, and rose victorious for me. And so today I trust you. I trust you completely. Save me from my sins. Thank you for saving me. If that's your prayer today, would you thank him? In a moment, we're going to have men and women in the different corners of this room. We have a host online. And we would love to pray with you. As we sing this song, Asking the Lord to speak to us, to change us, to remove anything that's not honoring to him. Would you have the courage to step out of your seat and to come to one of these men, women that are here, ready to pray with you, ready to encourage you, ready to help you know that you are not alone? If that's your decision, would you move as the Spirit of God leads?